Hello, everyone. We'll be starting in just a minute. So I encourage everyone to take your seats now, and we'll have the panelists up on stage and get the uh, panel kicked off soon. Thank you. All right, good afternoon, everybody, and welcome. My name is Maureen Conway. I'm Vice President for Policy Programs here at the Aspen Institute and Executive Director of our Economic Opportunities Program. And I'm very delighted to welcome you all to today's conversation, Opportunity Zones and the Challenge of Addressing Our Economic Divides. This is our 36th conversation in our Working in America series. And, um, and just as a plug, I would like to say that we do record them all, and they're all available on our website um, at as.pn slash working in America. Um, but the thing I was thinking about as I thought about this is, you know, we've been doing this for about six years, and a lot's changed in our economy in, in the past six years. Um, in 2013, when we started, the unemployment rate was about 7%, so now at around 4%, it's, it's substantially lower. Um, the poverty rate is down over two points. Uh, the last I saw was in 2017, it's 12.3% uh, down from 14.5%. So, and in general, I think most of our measures would say our economy is substantially stronger uh, than it was six years ago. 
But while our national statistics indicate a robust U.S. economy, this economic success has not been felt uniformly across the country. Many communities felt, feel left out of and left behind by today's economy. And as the background materials, and I hope you got a chance to take a look at the background materials um, as they highlight, many communities are not wrong to feel this way. Um, and a, a shout out thanks to uh, EIG and to LISC for uh, sharing their materials with us as background for the event. Um, the communities, uh, and you can see from the, those materials that the communities designated as opportunity zones are doing markedly less well than the nation in terms of poverty, employment, and other economic measures. Um, so the conversation about economic opportunity zones uh, focuses on communities that have been left out. Um, and this is a particularly relevant conversation for us in the Economic Opportunities Program. Uh, in the Economic Opportunities Program, our, in our day-to-day -day work, um, we really focus on communities in need of better opportunity. And we're deeply engaged in questions of how to advance practical action that expand the quality of economic opportunity available to people so that all people in the United States can live and work with dignity. Uh, specifically, we focus on opportunities for people to connect to work and to find good jobs to provide a decent livelihood. And we also focus on opportunities for entrepreneurship, how people can start their own businesses, and how more people can participate in ownership of business assets as an economic opportunity strategy. And importantly, we also focus on how we can expand opportunity in a way that is inclusive and addresses our long-standing economic divides along the lines of race, ethnicity, and gender, as well as along the lines of geography. So the discussion of opportunity zones highlights all of these issues. I'm very delighted we have uh, all of you here with us uh, to have this conversation. Uh, just a couple of notes before we begin. I would like to note that we are uh, recording and live streaming this conversation, and we're uh, delighted to welcome our colleagues from C-SPAN here today. Um, so please do silence your phones, uh, but please do tweet during our conversation. Our hashtag is TalkGoodJobs. Uh, I also want to thank uh, Prudential Financial, the Walmart Foundation, and the Ford Foundation for their support of the Working in America series. Uh, we couldn't do this uh, without their support and thought partnership, and we're extremely grateful to them. And now we really have a fantastic panel to have this conversation, so let me briefly uh, introduce them by putting names to faces. We have materials about them and uh, uh, information. You have their biographies, so uh, take a look at their uh, tremendous experience. But I will just uh, quickly uh, start with uh, Tomas Duran, who is on my right uh, to your left. Uh, Tomas is the president of Concerned Capital. Uh, next to Tomas is uh, Ty Cooper, Managing Director, Policy and Advocacy at the New Jersey Economic Development Authority. Uh, next to Ty, we have Maurice Jones, President and CEO of LISC. And next to Maurice is Kenan Fickrey, Director for Research Economic Innovation Group. And I'm delighted to introduce my uh, wonderful colleague, Joyce Klein, who will be moderating today's event. Uh, Joyce leads the Economic Opportunities Program's work on um, uh, business ownership as an economic opportunity strategy, and she's director of our field initiative. So Joyce, I turn it over to you. Great, thank you. Well, I'd like to add my thanks to Maureen, to all of you for joining us for today. And um, thank you for putting up, the, those of you who we started late, you know, thank you for putting up with the long line if you were here in person. and the delay for those of us who are joining you virtually. It's a really good sign for us. Maureen mentioned that we've done like 36 of these events now. This is the first time we haven't provided lunch, so we were wondering <laughs> how that might cut into our crowd. Um, we're glad that you're enjoying the snacks, and we're, we're glad that you're with us today for this, this conversation. Um, so in 2017, the Congress passed the Investing in Opportunity Act, which created a new structure and incentive uh, for uh, investing in low-income communities, and those are obviously opportunity zones, what we're here to talk about today. Um, this new incentive has generated a lot of interest um, and discussion, I think, among those of us who care about what happens in the lives of low-income individuals mm -hmm. and the communities where they work. Uh, and there's been a lot of work done at the state and the local levels to try to lay the groundwork um, to select the areas that are, gonna, that are opportunity zones, which have now been identified, and then to try to shape and support the kinds of investment that will happen there. You know, I think with, with any strategy that's looking to, to increase investment in uh, low-income communities, the question is not just 
where development's going to happen, mm -hmm. what kind of development's going to happen, but also who benefits from the investment that happens in those communities. Um, so what kinds of jobs are being created? Who gets those jobs? How good are those jobs? Um, if we're seeing investment in property and real estate and businesses, not only are those assets growing, but who's benefiting from that growth? Um, and as you might expect from the name of our program is the Economic Opportunities Program here at Aspen. So we've been keenly interested in trying to follow along with the development uh, and the implementation and response to this, this new tool that we have at our disposal. Um, and part of that is because in the last couple of years, we've really focused on keenly on two issues. One is on issues of job quality. So we know there are issues with employment levels. But as Maureen has said, our economy has recovered in the past couple of years in most places. But what we really need to be thinking about now is what are the quality of jobs that are being created. And when we talk about quality, we talk about things like decent wages and benefits. And are jobs accessible through transportation? Do they have predictable schedules so people can manage their personal lives and responsibilities in addition to their working lives? Um, are there opportunities for mobility for people? Um, so that's one issue we've been focusing a lot on. And then in the work that I lead around business ownership, um, which is a longstanding area of work, but one of the things we've been increasingly focused on is how do disparities in who's able to open and create and grow businesses play into these critical issues we have around income and wealth inequality in the US, particularly along racial lines. Um, and so when we think about the racial wealth gap, we talk about this a lot. We talk about the disparities in the overall wealth levels or mm -hmm. net worth levels of black and Latino families relative to white families. And we know that white families have about 10 times the wealth of black and Latino families. But what's also important to look at is not just the overall wealth levels, but what kinds of assets do people mm -hmm. own? And how do those assets appreciate over time? Um, how do they create diversification in, in household balance sheets? And one of the things that we've been looking a lot at is the fact that um, for many black and Latino families, we see lower levels of investment, lower levels of assets in terms of business and financial assets on their household balance sheets. We see more concentration in assets that are depreciating, like cars or assets, real estate assets, housing assets that haven't recovered in their value since the recession. So thinking about what kind of assets people own, I think is really important, and particularly thinking about business assets. So when we think about opportunity zones, we're thinking about what are the investments in real estate and facilities and businesses in low-income communities? Are those going to grow? And who is going to benefit from the value that's created through these investments? And that's really what we're, what we're here to talk about today. So our panelists are really deeply qualified to talk <laughs> about this. Um, not only because they've played a role in creating this idea <laughs> of opportunity zones, but they've really been on the front lines of trying to, again, sort of set the stage for how this might um, unfold, this new tool might unfold over time. So we're going to be in dialogue for them for probably the next 45 minutes or so. Um, and then we're going to open it up for questions. We're going to take live questions in the room. If you have a question and you're watching virtually, um, either on our live stream and our, also C-SPAN's here today, so welcome to them. You can just tweet those questions at our Talk Good Jobs hashtag, and we'll queue them up. Um, the other thing I just want to note is we're not going to do sort of a primer on opportunity zones. We have materials for you. Um, we have information from LISC and the Economic Innovation Group, which both have really good FA, FAQs on their websites about this. Um, Ty, shout out your uh, your um, URL for New Jersey has a great NJ website. Opportunitiesones.nj.gov. So you can check that out. There you go. Um, there are links to those on our website for those who are joining remotely if you want to look up some basic questions. But we're going to sort of stay higher level. So, um, so I'm going to start with Kenan. Uh, for two reasons. One is because um, EIG, his organization, was really, this idea of opportunity zones was a response to some really important research they did looking at the lack of dynamism in many communities in the US um, and thinking about what a potential response might be. Also, he and his wife just had a baby two weeks ago, and so we're going to get him before he falls asleep. <laughs> uh, yeah. So uh, <laughs> congratulations. Why don't you, you uh, you're welcome. <laughs> Um, give us a quick overview of what the problems were you saw in communities and why you thought Opportunity Zones were a solution. Sure, sure. Uh, now, actually, just last week, the University of Minnesota uh, released a report that found that uh, there is not a single metro area in the United States in which a poor person is more likely to live in a growing area than a declining one. Hmm. So let that sink in for a moment. That is a really profound statistic, and I think it's a really damning indictment of how, right now, our economics mesh with our demographics and geography. 
And our own research at EIG uh, stems primarily from our Distressed Communities Index, which you know, classifies all zip codes in the US on seven different metrics of economic well-being, groups them into quintiles. Uh, if you look from 27, uh, 2007 to 2016, uh, the bottom one-fifth of US zip codes, uh, distressed communities, uh, they have lost uh, 1.3 million jobs on net over that almost 10-year period. There has been essentially no recovery from the Great Recession for the people who need it most. Uh, and then on the flip side of that, uh, prosperous communities, the top one-fifth of zip codes, uh, where people are already the best off on all sorts of socioeconomic indicators, uh, they've seen a job bonanza of net 3.1 million jobs uh, over that same period. So essentially, we channel all of our growth energy towards uh, the people in places who are already doing well, and we channel very little of it um, to the people in places who, who need it most. So Opportunity Zones is really designed to uh, smash that equilibrium, mm -hmm. and it is a, uh, it is a bold policy that um, you know, tries to meet the challenge uh, at the same scale of the challenge, right? So it is meant to help make the market work in favor of these communities rather than against them. And it does that by changing the incentive calculus for investors as they decide uh, where to place their capital. And I think we're seeing already uh, that, that um, you know, investors uh, and even communities themselves as they reevaluate themselves in the wake of this new incentive, uh, they are seeing, you know, all of the hard work and entrepreneurial, uh, entrepreneurialism uh, still in the populations. Uh, They're seeing the good bones that many uh, American communities still have. Uh, and and uh, they're working with investors and thinking what commitments they're going to um, bring to the table to uh, unlock, unlock value in places that for uh, a long time now, in some cases decades, uh, have been kind of uh, 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 a community where um, no investor is going to put their money if they assume that it's going to be declining in value because no one else is putting their money there. Uh, so Opportunity Zones is uh, innovative in that it's, it's kind of, it's, it's a jump ball policy. You know, the federal government uh, provided the ball and some loose framework, uh, loose uh, rules around that are still under development around, you know, how to, how to play the game. Uh, the states drew the lines on the court, mm -hmm. uh, but now it's really up to uh, stakeholders, up to communities and states and the private sector and uh, folks like uh, Lisk and others to, to be entrepreneurial and be creative and, and do something with this ball and see what they can create from it. So in that sense, we're kind of at a, a, a T0 in a kind of primordial soup state um, <laughs> where, where you know, this, it's still in the state, it's in the state of becoming. And I think that's really exciting. Some people see risks there, uh, but that's why it's, it's so important that conversations like this are being convened mm -hmm. so more people kind of get involved and figure out how they can really make something from uh, what has immense potential. Okay, terrific. Well, thank you. So sure. we're going to start by talking a little bit about what we think the potential is for this new tool that's out there and sure. really just about to emerge in many ways. So I'm going to start with Maurice. You've worked at the community development level. You've done some work locally, a lot of work at the state and federal levels. And now you're at LISC, which I will say is the Local Initiative Supports Corporation, <laughs> for, in case people don't know what that acronym is. Um, and that's really a national organization that uses investment as a tool to help build more inclusive and resilient communities. So you've got a new investment tool, potentially. What's your take on the potential of what that means for the communities you work in? So I think the potential is tremendous. Um, and I think it's tremendous for at least a couple of reasons. One, this is a tool that is designed to attract to these communities investors that for the most part are not there right now, right? And however you value it, whether it's six trillion or several hundred billion, I'll take the several hundred billion, right? It <laughs> is high net worth individuals, people with capital gains. These are not folks right now who are either institutionally or individually who are playing at a substantial level in the communities that we're talking about. Mm -hmm. So this tool, if nothing else, gives us an opportunity to have a conversation with those investors. That's pretty substantial. Secondly, this is equity. This mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. is a tool designed to attract equity for a substantial period of time. And if you're going to truly help people in these communities transform, patience is what you need. This is about patient equity capital. Uh, and so in those two senses, at least, the opportunity here is tremendous. Now, there are risks, and I'm yeah. sure we'll talk about that as well. But um, 
potentially, this is the most, um, this is the largest tool for the kind of work in the communities that we're talking about mm -hmm. that we've seen, potentially, mm -hmm. with caveats that we should return to. OK, terrific. <laughs> Thank you. So Ty, um, opportunity zones are designed as a tool to incentivize private capital. Mm -hmm. um, but there's a state and local governments are going to play a big role here Absolutely. in what potentially will happen and how that plays out. So. You've spent time in the city of Newark, which I know you'll talk about, but Obviously. right now you're with the your state of New Jersey. Um, and so tell us from your vantage point as someone who cares, is working at state and also has worked at local government, how you see the value of opportunity zones. So I'm going to move back a little bit and just start kind of from where the state looked at opportunity zones. So it starts with the leader, and I think we have a phenomenal leader in Governor Phil Murphy. He has a vision, and when he first came into office, what he was focusing on was a stronger and fairer New Jersey, and we took that to heart with everything we were doing, not just from the economic development plan that we put forward, but also with opportunity zones, right? So he focused on investing in people, invest, investing in communities, making New Jersey more business friendly, and making us, again, the state of innovation. So that set kind of the groundwork for what we were going to do going forward with opportunity zones. In the state, one of the first things we wanted to focus on, again, was bringing all of these different entities together that are part of the state that would touch this. And so, again, you have the New Jersey Economic Development Authority, the governor's office leading, the New Jersey Department of Community Affairs, which touches every single municipality, DEP, you have the Housing Mortgage Finance Agency, and then also the New Jersey Redevelopment Authority, which we work with Leslie a lot. And so you're bringing all of these different entities together, working together, breaking down silos, and really focusing on what's the most important thing. And for us, the most important thing, quite honestly, was just ensuring that we were going to have inclusivity and equity when it came right down to economic development in these areas. This is very personal for me and for so many of you that are out there because, again, I'm a, a girl from Newark. That's where I start. That's where I'll end. That's what I love constantly. But it's not just the Newarks. It's all the other cities that play a role in this. So we created this interagency task force, again, and our, our whole role was to identify the best zones. So we used the Municipal Revitalization Index, and we did an overlay with transportation to identify the 169 zones that we were able to select. And part of that process also, and we cannot forget this, is to constantly over-communicate, over-engage every stakeholder in every community you can. So we had a concurrence process where we worked directly with municipalities, the economic development directors, and we identified the zones. But if it didn't fit with where their development was going, we listened. And again, through this process, we made some changes. They still fit within that bandwidth, which was designations for an opportunity zone census tract. But again, you have to listen to the municipalities that are driving the growth, driving the development within their respective areas. And so for us, um, at the statewide level, it's still being very intentional about the work that we're doing, lining up all of our resources so that they're, they're layering on top of opportunity zones. So we're excited that we were able to launch our one-stop shop um, a website, which we listed earlier before, but this website, again, has something for everyone. If you're an investor, if you're a developer, if you're a stakeholder, if you just want general information, all of that is on the website. If you want information on how to track the growth and development, we've also set up a system for that as well. And most importantly, I think we've created this interactive map, which is the best map that I think is out there in the nation right now. It's got about 67 layers, and it lines up all of the incentives that we have going from the state. So if you're an area in need of redevelopment, if you're a transit-oriented development, wherever you are, wherever there's a state incentive, it's been lined up on this map so that everyone, from a beginner user to a developer, has access to know what resources are there and how we can build upon what we've already started. Right. So this is really a private incentive, but you're trying to figure out how do we just not have this happen exclusively on the private side, but really meld with what communities and Absolutely. municipalities Absolutely. want to make happen, Absolutely. and how do we make all that visible to the Absolutely. developers and also the community. Absolutely. Terrific. So Tomas, you're a local economic <laughs> development, community yeah. development guy. You've worked in LA in yes. many different roles. Um, your focus right now is on business development and thinking about how do you take businesses that exist in your communities and where the business owners may be retiring and make sure that those businesses stay in those communities yep. and that the ownership transfers to folks who live in those communities and maybe the employees? So that's your lens you bring to this. <laughs> tell us better than I would. <laughs> <laughs> We've been talking for a while. Um, tell us how you view the potential value of opportunity right. zones in that equation. Well, we're excited. I mean, and we think that there's a great opportunity here to use, um, depending on actually what the final regulations say. Um, whether or not it can be used for businesses and helping businesses grow if you can operate and actually invest into an operating business. Um, hopefully the regulations will come out that allow us to do that. 
Um, but in case that it's not, and it's more real estate focused, we see it as an opportunity to create things like business parks, industrial parks mm -hmm. that are seeded with patient capital that allow them to be competitive with the housing developments that where I'm from in California tend to be a lot more lucrative for the developers. So potentially, depending on how things play out, there may be a really important source of capital, at least for the real well, estate where those businesses are. Absolutely. And potentially. And, and we've, uh, to the point where we've had conversations with uh, people in the private equity space mm -hmm. around creating funds that are specifically focused on uh, locating businesses in the qualified zones and then building the workforce by recruiting from people in that area. And, and so I think there's a great opportunity there. But again, it has to depend on the final regulations. So, so that was a great segue, because the next place <laughs> we were going to go is this law was created in 2017. Yep. There's a regulatory process and some other stuff that needs to happen. So Kenan's going to catch us up on sure. where we are right now. Sure. Uh, we are not as far along as we should be. Uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, we, are, we currently have draft one of three tranches of regulations out, or draft one of tranche one of three. Uh, so the, the regulatory process has been slower than I think anyone uh, uh, originally anticipated, uh, especially given that there are so many dates certain built into the statute. Uh, so uh, anyway, tranche one, as far as it went, the draft uh, was, was broadly favorable for uh, anyone interested in doing real estate investments. Mm -hmm. uh, it cleared a lot of the kind of low-hanging fruit um, out of the way and uh, clarified you know, what type of capital gains or what type of gains can be rolled over. And some, some of the, the very fundamental basics mm -hmm. took them a year to do. Uh, so <laughs> now, now we're waiting on uh, tranche two, which we are told will be dropped imminently, um, but we don't know. Deep. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. <laughs> Imminent is relative. Yeah. 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 <laughs> um, but uh, this, this, so we are looking uh, in the read of tranche two uh, mm -hmm. for the proactive intent and understanding on behalf of Treasury uh, that uh, Opportunity Zones was intended first and foremost to start to deliver that holy grail of community development capital, which mm -hmm. is scarce equity risk capital for businesses, not just for real estate. Uh, that's that's the, 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 one of the areas where past um, attempts at, at uh, place-based tax incentive has fallen short. And two, that, that opportunity funds are meant to be funds and not meant to be kind of opportunity zone shell corporations that yeah. you just structure investments <laughs> through um, so that you can have a diversified portfolio of investments that invest in you know, multiple assets, potentially multiple places. And again, this is really important for operating businesses because mm -hmm. uh, you, you know, they, they fail, uh, they grow out of zones naturally, and you might have to divest from them to put your capital elsewhere. Mm -hmm. uh, so for this to really practically be available to um, people who want to seed new businesses and employers and wealth creators and get, I think, maximum impact out of this, uh, it just needs to be workable there. Uh, so um, we are, our fingers are crossed, and that's going to be the kind of threshold question for us, uh, whether or not this is on course to accomplish what we all hoped or whether it's um, going to undershoot its ultimate potential. And then tranche three of the regulations is going to uh, address uh, data collection and measurement, uh, anti-fraud abuse go. provisions, and uh, the kind of fund decertification process. So all the stuff that's giving uh, everyone the kind of PR heartburn uh, is coming. It's just coming last, <laughs> which is really annoying. <laughs> but uh, so that, 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 uh, that's kind of the, the, the landscape right now. Great. But for those of us who are particularly focused on economic development and mm -hmm. business development as well as real estate development, this next tranche is really important. The, yeah, this next tranche is, okay. I'd say, okay. make or break for OZ proponents. OK, terrific. Yeah. Um, anyone else on the panel have, want to add anything about what you're looking for or hoping for in terms of this next set of regulations that are going to come I mean, out? I think just across the board for states, for CDCs, for nonprofits, just looking for more clarity to make sure, again, that there's more guardrails put in place. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think that's one thing that we hear constantly from municipalities and constantly, again, from CDCs. This is great, but how do we ensure that the development and the resources and the funding that's flowing in here is going towards its intended measure, right? And mm -hmm. so I think that's a concern that exists. It's going to exist until it's resolved, and so I'm glad that you guys are looking at that. But also, it gives states and municipalities an opportunity to create a framework to measure what yeah. social impacts and you know what, what environmental impacts are being measured as well, right? Yeah, exactly. That's one of the mm -hmm. kind of silver linings of the regulatory delay. It has given states and localities a lot of time to catch up and kind of get ahead of the market. Uh, so I think that that uh, will ultimately you know, facilitate good outcomes, and there will be a long tail of investment, so it's not like 2019 or bust. Um, but mm -hmm. yeah, that's right. I think, um, additionally, the time frames mm -hmm. right now that we're working with, um, given how, how late the actual rules are and the clock is ticking and you're supposed to invest within 180 days of gains and then you've got to, mm -hmm. 
I'm hopeful that we will see uh, some uh, evolution on the time frame. Otherwise, mm, only those pl places most prepared mm -hmm. with shovel-ready mm -hmm. projects right now are going to benefit. And that would be, um, going back to what was said earlier, inconsistent with the spirit and the intention of this legislation. Mm -hmm. One other thing too, it just in the actual application of the investment, if you're doing it within 180 days, they may not give you enough time to go and access your leverage. And so you may be in a position where you're just putting all equity into a project. And if it doesn't go forward and you're stuck, it creates a lot of issues for the people who've not only invested, but um, creates further disincentive for additional investment going down in the future. So the, the timing is gonna be really, really key. Yeah, that's right. Great, so thank you for that flag. Well, see what things look like, <laughs> hopefully soon. Um, so let's, we talked a little bit about the potential, maybe we'll get into some of the, the, the pitfalls now, or some of the challenges, maybe not all pitfalls, but challenges. And I'm gonna, Ty, I'm gonna, I'm gonna come back to you. So we've talked about the role that, the fact that local and state governments are really key to how this plays out on the ground. And thinking about a state like New Jersey, you've got, some, you've got your Newark, <laughs> you've got Trenton, you've got big cities, but you've also got a lot of very small municipalities that don't have a lot of development infrastructure, yeah. don't have big teams on, yeah. you know, in place. So how's the state thinking about how it works across that spectrum of communities and what might work in some of the smaller, more rural communities? So it's one of those things where there's 565 municipalities in the state of New Jersey in 21 counties, right? And so you're gonna have a different approach to each municipality that you're working with. And so I think one of the things that this has re-engaged within the state is to utilize the resources that we have in place. So we have the Department of Community Affairs, which has the local planning services, which touches each and every municipality that exists, small or large. But specifically with Opportunity Zones, we're using the local planning services, we're using EDA and all of our resources as well to meet people exactly where they are. So we're going to the communities that need the information the most and walking them through the process. For your Nork, you just did a huge Amazon play. It's the same thing for Jersey City, you're prepared. But for some of those smaller communities that have part-time staffs, you have to be really intentional because a lot of what you're gonna realize you're, you're doing at this point is building up capacity and helping them where they are. So one of the great things that we're focusing on right now um, is an innovation challenge focused on opportunity zones. And this one is specifically to help municipalities, small and large, um, build up capacity, offer technical assistance, help, help them with, um, with drafting their investment prospectus, but also highlighting what the resources are within those respective areas. And so again, it's not a one size fits all. It's gonna be very intentional going from the smallest city to the largest city. They all still have work that needs to be done, but the most important thing that I would impress upon for any of them is just making sure their zoning and planning boards are on point, making sure that they understand the process and the importance of those roles, because that can stymie growth and process at so many levels. And so even throughout Opportunity Zones, if we can figure out a better way to streamline that process or automate that process for municipalities, that's gonna be a huge win. Because as, 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 when mm -hmm. there's a time zone, the timeline kicking, <laughs> like people yeah. have to be ready to move and make decisions Absolutely. so that that development can happen and you're building up their capacity to do that. Um, so Tomas, some of the concerns with opportunity funds that we've heard people talk about are they're concerned about things like gentrification or displacement of some of certain communities. So um, I'm wondering if you could give us an example, because um, we're talking about challenges or potential pitfalls, <laughs> of an investment that you think is not the kind of investment that's going to help the communities that you care about. And how should community leaders thinking about be thinking about what kind of investments aren't going to help and maybe what might be helpful? Yeah, I think one of the key challenges with the program is the lack of transparency. Mm -hmm. um, unlike other economic development programs, or this isn't a program, it's just a tax credit. There's no requirement for the person taking the credit to say, I did this. I made this investment. This is happening in my backyard. Mm -hmm. So it could happen next to you and you wouldn't know. Um, and so that's a big challenge for um, municipalities, for communities, for the people who live in that area because it can accelerate gentrification and you're not even knowing what's happening. Right. Um, so one of the things that we have been talking with a lot with the communities where I'm at um, is making sure that you understand, like, like Ty had said, is that there's a public process that you have to go through. Mm -hmm. And each step of the way, there has to be some, somebody checks and balances, making sure that, that uh, people are paying attention to what's happening. And if you're seeing a lot of influx, if you're seeing a lot of uh, assemblage of land, which unfortunately where, where we are in Southern California, a lot of these um, places aren't being redeveloped because the lot sizes are small. It takes a lot of equity, a lot of money to assemble the land. It takes a lot of patient capital. And so things don't happen. And so if all of a sudden things are starting to happen, 
Well, then someone needs to pay attention and say, well, wait a second. You know, who are you? What are you doing? How can we be involved? And luckily, I think that because the uh, cities have the magic wand of entitlement mm -hmm. and they have another, a whole toolbox of economic development tools available to them, they can incentivize an own, uh, a developer to come forward and say, I am doing this and has, here's how I could use your help because they're still going to have the same challenges of raising the debt for construction and for permanent finance for whatever it is that they build. Okay, great. Super helpful. Um, Maurice, um, you and your organization have long worked in the kinds of communities we're trying to stimulate development in, um, the ones that have historically not been invested in, which is why you're excited about this. I, 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 we heard you talk about that. Um, what can we learn from previous strategies? This isn't the first strategy <coughs> to try to drive investment. So what can we learn from those previous efforts that can make this one more successful? And how are you thinking about what might be possible in the communities you care about. And if you could also just talk a little bit to rural as well as urban, mm. that would be really yep. helpful. I threw a lot at you there, but yep. I know you can do it. <laughs> and I'm having uh, more and more senior moments, so you may have to remind okay. me <laughs> of, of those queries. But um, what was your first? No, I'm <laughs> uh, Look, I think there are several lessons to learn. Uh, one is um, that there is no one tool that is the cure-all. Yep. And so there is a lot of hype about Opportunity Zones. Mm -hmm. Rightly so, I think it has a lot of potential. It will not by itself transform the communities that we're talking about. That's right. And so uh, we need to, uh, uh, there is the, the Fed chair who used to say uh, irrational exuberance. We need to have more rational exuberance mm -hmm. about what the what the real opportunity is here. It has tremendous opportunity, mm -hmm. but it has to be paired with a lot of other work mm -hmm. to truly transform the communities that we're talking about. You still got to invest in the most important asset in all of these communities remains the people. That's right remains the people. We still have to invest in the people's ability to earn a living mm -hmm. at livable wage or beyond, right? And you still have to invest in great schools. You still have to invest in parks and recreations. You still have to invest in transportation. Opportunity zones are not going to cure all that, mm -hmm. right? They can be a partner to that, but not the cure all. Mm -hmm. So that's the, the first thing that we learn is You've got to be multifaceted mm -hmm. in this, mm -hmm. in this work. Um, I would say um, a second lesson for us is that you're going to need, and this is connected, you're going to need multiple kinds of capital to do the work. <coughs> You're still going to need philanthropic yep. dollars. Yep. You're still going to need yep. debt. You're still going to need equity. You're still going to need technical assistance in most of the places where we're talking about in order to maximize what mm -hmm. Opportunity Zone capital uh, can do. Um, and then thirdly, and I want to connect this to rule. Look, at the end of the day, in order for um, Opportunity Zones to truly um, maximize uh, their potential, you've got to have a pipeline of investable projects. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. That's going to be the main thing. Uh, investors will come if you can mitigate risk and give them projects. What that means is capacity building right. in these communities, and that's going to be particularly important for rural America. Mm -hmm. yep is actually the most important investment you can make. If you don't do that, there won't be opportunity zone opportunities. I hate to use opportunities so much. We gotta find a new word. I know. <laughs> I know. Um, but if you look particularly in rural areas, it's helping rural areas with uh, broadband infrastructure, right. helping rural areas actually put together projects that are project ready and investable. Mm -hmm. those, those sort of prerequisite investments are what you're going to have to do uh, with most urgency in order, to, um, in order to maximize this. Last message on this, <laughs> local aggressiveness, mm -hmm. local 
control mm -hmm. local ownership, local that's right. coalitions, that's mm -hmm. going to be the game changer. Mm -hmm. Waiting for anybody at the federal level, anybody outside of your community, mm -hmm. is a futile wait. The way you ensure that this works mm -hmm. is a coalition of folks at the local level come together and own it. Agreed. That's mm -hmm. what you're going to need to do to really Agreed. maximize this. Mm -hmm. That's, those have been some of our more important lessons. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Terrific. Ty, did you want to add to that? I see a lot of head nodding happening. It's I like did. an amen corner over here. <laughs> yeah, it's like a church corner. It really is. So, so I definitely agree with local municipalities, the CDCs that exist, the churches that are there. They've been doing this work. They've been in the field for so long. They've been the ones behind the scenes that are moving this work forward. But I would also say still in with that, make sure they know what incentives are available for them on a statewide level. So yes. we're doing our NJ Aspire program, our NJ Forward program. So these are tax-based incentives. Some are focused on growth. Others are focused on development. And what we're doing in a, as a state is ensuring whether it's a brownfield program or whatever we're focusing on, that opportunity zones are linked to that. So with our NJ Aspire program, we're connecting eight bonus points that are additional if you're building in an opportunity zone. Wow. If you're looking at low-income housing tax credits through our New Jersey Housing Mortgage Finance Authority, we're ensuring that if you develop in opportunity zones, you get double points. And so these are things as well, while you're working on a local level, how the state can also assist you and move forward with these initiatives. And so we're hyper-focused on that and hyper-focused on reaching people where they are as well. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Can I add to that? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I think, so this is the, the toolbox that was also mentioned right, earlier, right? right? And, and so what our focus really is on what we like to call grassroots economic development. That's, right. that's why we work specifically with the businesses. And what we see as an opportunity, because of the large number of baby boomers that are retiring, a large we see that as a big threat to the operating businesses going forward. Mm -hmm. And the opportunity zone, if the regulations allow it going forward, it can be a great um, source of uh, funds that would allow for those businesses to access capital to transition from that retiring owner to hopefully the workers. Because right. nothing keeps um, jobs local by like local ownership. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so the the Opportunity Zone as, as a program presents another conduit of capital, right? And it's just, it's a matter of just making sure, like Mark said, you have that pipeline, but also that you understand what your local market is. Yeah. What are the viable businesses in your local market? Because unfortunately, what we're gonna start seeing going forward is a lot of businesses closing, not because they can't make it, but because the owner wants to retire. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, we need that capital for that. Okay. Yeah. Gonna file on with a couple of things too. <laughs> <Good>. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so just on local, absolutely. You know, local capital is going to move first. That's going to be a prerequisite for like getting non-local capital to come in be, uh, behind. You know, they want to see that uh, the city has. Uh, you know, it's it's uh, it's in the game. That that you know, local incentives are aligned. That um, other people are dedicated to. Um, this this opportunity zone being a success. So absolutely, uh, on on uh, rural and capacity building, I think that this is one place where philanthropies especially can engage, uh, and uh, we've already seen also at the state level, um, New Jersey, Colorado, Minnesota, uh, come up with uh, you know just just you know planning grants or these a lot of a lot of rural areas just are on shoestring budgets. They they don't. They can't come up with their own opportunities on prospectus or don't have the money for it. So that's a really easy way that philanthropies can uh, kind of bridge, bridge the gap. And then uh, entities like Opportunity Alabama is a new statewide intermediary that sprouted up uh, to try to kind of uh, um, serve as, yeah, or uh, allow rural areas to operate, you know, through it and reach investors and source their projects through kind of a, a platform, you know, that they're all sharing rather than replicating it uh, individually. And then uh, pitfalls, the one uh, big one that I'm worried about is that, you know, the uh, Opportunity Zones does get viewed at in isolation and that especially the workforce development system doesn't like, jump right in yeah. and yeah. see itself as the critical connective tissue. Yeah. Uh, we did we did a really comprehensive uh, benchmarking of opportunity zones and found that you know across the 8700 uh, in the U.S. there are more adults uh, that do not have a high school diploma yeah. than have a college degree in opportunity zones. So that is a lot of workforce development and education system connective tissue that needs to be forged to make sure that you know uh, people can access um, the jobs and, and really are able to directly uh, feel feel the the impact of these investments. 
Do you think it also offers another opportunity just because, again, the facts are so glaring, they're so in your face right now? It mm -hmm. forces states to look yeah. at apprenticeship programs. It forces yeah. municipalities to kind yeah. of pivot and shift how they're doing things as well. Yeah, yeah, and all that great work is going to become easier if the market is working in their favor again. You know, <laughs> yeah. if, if there is investment coming That's into right. these communities, if, you know, there are jobs to be had uh, after people go through these programs. Mm -hmm. uh, so, yeah, Absolutely. yeah, for sure. So we, we, were gonna, we were talking about pitfalls, but we also got some good <laughs> advice there about how to make this really work. So I'm going to go to um, maybe ask, what are some of the, what's maybe the most innovative thing that you've heard happening so far uh, in terms of a potential project or a potential way of organizing around this work? Well, Okay, uh, oh sorry, uh, I'm really excited. I think maybe because I grew up in an old industrial region, I'm really excited that uh, this seems, Opportunity Zones really seems to be working for brownfield remediations and redevelopments. Yeah. Uh, and uh, if you are a public policy nerd, I think that the uh, EPA comment letter uh, for the first round of regulations was one of the best pieces of policy writing I've read or I've seen in a long time. Uh, it was exciting for those of us who care about brownfields. Uh, and you know, we've seen in uh, East Chicago, Indiana, uh, a big 400-acre uh, old DuPont chemical site has been uh, condemned uh, as hazardous for 26 years and nothing's happened. And now Opportunity Zone Capital finally closed the deal. Similarly, in Birmingham, Alabama, uh, smack middle of downtown, there's an old building from the American Life Insurance Company, which is very symbolic. It's been empty for 36 years with American Life still emblazoned across the side. Uh, just found out that you know, the, between the city, uh, Alabama Historic Preservation Tax Credits and Opportunity Zone financing, that's going to be reconverted into uh, affordable space, you know, apartments dedicated for returning citizens from the criminal justice system. Stuff like that is really innovative and exciting. Uh, and I think by definition, if the thing's been empty for 36 years, uh, it would not have happened without the Opportunity Zone's incentive. Mm -hmm. So I want to see more of that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would add mm -hmm. <clears throat> um, the city of Indianapolis has put together a consortium. It's a consortium of public sector officials, mm -hmm. private sector officials, philanthropic officials, investors, uh, and they are uh, doing a couple things. You know, one of the issues that we've got to make sure of, um, and this is showing my bias, uh, <laughs> with Opportunity Zones is to know who's playing and where they're playing. Mm -hmm. um, and they, so they've created a portal to create some transparency mm -hmm. regarding investors, regarding where projects are in the project um, pipeline, mm -hmm. and in an effort really to try to match investors with projects that they want to see done, right. that they want to see pushed across the mm -hmm. finish line. This did not require a whole lot of mm -hmm. uh, capital. It required a coalition of folks from the public and private sector to come together to commit. This is the local ownership piece. Mm -hmm. That, I think, for the long game, is one of the ways in which we're really going to have the kind of results that we want from this, this endeavor. Great. That's a great example of that local <laughs> piece that you talked about. Ty? No, agreed. I mean, we're focusing on something similar with the creation of a digital marketplace, again, connecting mm -hmm. investors yeah. to those pipeline projects that exist to the local community. So I think that's a really great way for states and municipalities to work together. Um, and then also, I just have to shout out, because there's so much great stuff that's happening. But when I see young folks really leaning into this work, I get excited. So for Mike Anderson, who's part of the New York Venture Partners, who's running Impact, who's creating a $200 million fund, I get excited. He's a young man from Newark who believes in this, went to Harvard, came back, and is really leaning into this work. I get excited about you know, organizations like Golden Door Asset Management, who are focused specifically on businesses. They're right in Newark, New Jersey, and they're taking their show nationally, which I think is really exciting. And then again, for folks like Ron Bate, who have Teachers Village, who he just went public with one of his funds as well. So bias, these are all things that are happening in New Jersey. They're all exciting things that are happening in New Jersey. And a lot of them, they're happening right in Newark. So for me, that's really personal point of pride as I see Anthony Santiago from Newark as well. <laughs> Tomas? Um, I think one of the more exciting things for me is I've been talking with a private equity uh, firm that's going to be creating a fund that's focused on um, creating an impact with the workforce by mm -hmm. creating quality jobs. And so what they're looking at is identifying businesses that, that uh, have growth potential that they want to relocate into an opportunity zone, mm -hmm. then grow that, grow that business with uh, personnel from the opportunity zone, but incentivize that workforce to stay by profit sharing and by um, eventually creating a path to ownership. And the opportunity zone's patient capital is creating a situation where they can do that and build that up over time. And so it's a, it's a 
I like that it's turning that impact investment almost on its head yes. um, mm -hmm. because it's looking at not necessarily the, the product that's being made, but the people who are part of that mm -hmm. business. And how to give them that ownership give opportunity. That opportunity. Exactly. Fantastic. And keep that wealth within the community. Okay. So just to give folks a heads up, we're going to do one more quick round of questions, <laughs> uh, and then we're going to open up to you for your questions. So start thinking about what your questions are, and those of you who are want to tweet in your questions, please do so. Talk good jobs, hashtag. So, um, <laughs> So lightning round, um, both here and hopefully online, you have people who are thinking about how they connect to this issue, maybe on a local level, um, how they get engaged. What's one sort of idea, principle, message you want people to keep in mind as they think about how to connect to or how to support the kind of stuff that might happen because of Opportunity Zones? Yeah. Um, who wants to? Kenan, you oh, look like you're no. ready. Okay, yeah, okay. <laughs> no, I, I think, I think uh, agency uh, in that, you know, uh, people have a lot of agency around this. You know, it is, it is a tool. Uh, it will be what you, what you do with it. Uh, so I think that communities need to realize that, you know, they don't get railroaded by Opportunity Zone investment. Right. It comes in on their terms. So get ahead of it and, you know, be bold and say what you want it to do. Uh, and then I think that individuals, you know, should uh, respond to this entrepreneurial call to action uh, like Maurice has, like Ty has, uh, like, like we all have. Uh, and uh, yeah, and really try to do something with it because it's, it's rare that uh, a brand new um, bold policy innovation comes through uh, from the federal government. So let's, mm -hmm. let's make the most of it. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. Yeah. Look, I would add uh, just uh, remember first and foremost that this is a incentive that's about people. Right, and, and that we can't lose what this is supposed to be about, helping people from uh, underinvested, disinvested communities um, to transform those communities. That's the first thing. And then so secondly, in terms of how to get connected, um, I, you know, this is going to, again, show my bias, but go out and find a CDFI or mm -hmm. community-based organization to become a part of, to, to work with, uh, because they're on the front lines working with the very people that you need to have some expertise about if you're going to add value to their journey. Mm -hmm. And they know how to do that risk mitigation that you talked about. Absolutely. Been exactly. doing it for 40 plus years. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Find a list in your local area. Yes. <laughs> yes. Thirdly, work for less. No, no. <laughs> we all kind of do. <laughs> um, so I would say just, again, echoing kind of what Maurice said, that the impetus behind the program is on people and also places. Um, the focus is to drive capital into distressed communities. And so I want that focus to resonate, remain, and for us to activate these spaces in ways that it hasn't been done before. I get excited about it because it's something that's new. And we have a real opportunity, opportunity, opportunity over and over again <laughs> to make this into something that's credible and really last past these next couple of years, but something that changes communities dynamically with their input as well. I would say, you know, in LA, there's areas that, are, that it were destroyed during the civil unrest of the 90s that are still dirt. They haven't been rebuilt. There's, there's areas that from the unrest in the 60s that haven't been rebuilt. And it's not because, well, there's a lot of things. Why? Um, and I think this represents an opportunity for the communities to take hold of this and say, you know what? We want to see this here. We want to see something that's reflective or representative of us. Um, the mayor of Stockton, and, he, and I'm going to paraphrase this and murder it, but he likes to say, any solution that's, that's for us but doesn't include us isn't mm -hmm. about us. Mayor, um, uh, Mayor Stubbs, right? Facts. And that's got to be the attitude. We're worth the investment. We're worth the work. We're worth the, the brain damage of figuring out how to make these things happen. Mm -hmm. um, because the people in these communities have money. They're spending their money someplace. They're buying food someplace. They're buying clothes someplace. They're putting gas someplace, right? So. That's the perspective I'd like people to have. So we're not victimized by capital or, or, or real estate development, but we're partners. And what I've found is that most developers like having partners that are going to help them and support their project and help them understand how to be impactful in the community. Mm -hmm. Terrific. All right, we're going to uh, take some questions. Um, so just a few things. One is we do have microphones and, uh, microphones 
Um, so folks will bring those around, and we ask you to just wait for those. I'll call on you and ask you to wait for those just so that the people who are listening remotely can hear the question and I don't have to repeat it. Um, and I may start taking them in bunches if we get a whole bunch of questions. So I've got someone here in the front. Thank you, Amanda. I'll probably go back and forth different sides, but I'll try to remember who's got. Come on. So two quick questions, actually. And so, you know, one, you talked about, um, uh, you gave a lot of great pearls on like how local leaders can s essentially sell themselves. I actually saw a website in Duluth, Minnesota that is in partnership with List that is one of these platforms to connect capital to you know investment opportunities. But how do you keep 80% of what's going around to like three or 5% of the zones, right? And so that how, how can some more of those local areas you know, do more to get themselves out there so that that doesn't happen? And then also this idea around the human capital piece mm -hmm. and the fact that we're starting with real estate. I can certainly see that $20, $30 million affordable housing, supportive affordable housing project being supportive. But what about you know, preservation? And so you know, how do we keep neighborhoods from being gentrified and people getting displaced? Can we look at that uh, real estate mm -hmm. lens in a way that we're looking at preservation, perhaps provide, you, you know, creating lending pools so that you know, property owners can rehabilitate and keep right. rents affordable rather than getting demolished and replaced with that new development. Great, yep. great questions. Yep. And who um, wants to jump in? I'll, I'll start on the first one, if okay. you will. Look, I think this goes back to a point that, uh, that we talked about. Uh, there is this risk, right, that 4% of the zones will get all of the in investments. Um, the, the primary way to mitigate that again, is for local folks to mm -hmm. come together and get funds started in those communities, for those communities, uh, marketing those communities, yep. putting together yeah. the philanthropy. It, it really is about getting local ownership and local buy-in mm -hmm. to investing locally. You yes. can appeal the folks to invest locally, you've got to get prepared for them to have something to invest in. And so mm -hmm. the way we prevent this all cash to a few places is for local folks to not be agnostic about this, mm -hmm. for them to truly be aggressive in trying to. So I'm headed to Duluth tonight <laughs> with the hope that there won't be uh, <clears throat> a weather event. Right? <laughs> uh, but the re part of the reason is they Duluth is a town that is attempting to do just this. They're trying to mobilize a coalition to put together fund or funds that will invest in investable projects there. It starts there. When investors see folks making money in places, they will come. Yep. Mm -hmm. But local is where it will start. Mm -hmm. Do others want to address Yeah, that? I just want to, there's, I absolutely agree with that. And, and I think the, the other thing too is that if you do the work to understand what the attraction is to your community, right? What, what is it special? Why are you there, right? What your needs are, and you, you, you can um, quantify what that need is. And then you package that, and you market that. And let's say Opportunity Zone doesn't come. You still package that. You still know that. You're still ready to go and find other sources of capital that can come into that place. So you're starting to be proactive. And I think that's part of the challenge that I've had when I was working in economic development um, for a city is sometimes you're just not you're in a space where you're reactive and you're not yeah. proactive. And so right now, I think one of the great benefits of this program, even in, in its before our final regulations are out, it's forcing people to really start thinking about what they want to see and where they want to see it, what partners they want to have. And I think that's good for cities overall. One thing I would just add on is with, with what we did with the designation of our cities, we added a transportation overlay. Mm -hmm. And I think that's been really helpful. So yeah. municipalities that are along the same train line are working together. So in Union County, their economic development directors from Union County are working together to see how they can grow and support these opportunity zones along this train rail line, which has been really exciting yeah. to watch because it's a new way to do things. So it's not just the individual cities, but looking at how this can you can take this bigger um, and, and drive growth in that way as well. Cool. Just, just yeah. one more thing. <laughs> okay. Remember, this money is coming. <laughs> this money is coming from the stock market, right? It's, it's money that people are trying to um, delay capital gains tax on, right? It's not just Wall Street hedge funds. It's not just Silicon Valley investment bankers. It's people from your community. Yeah. And so there may be people locally 
that want to invest locally, but they won't know about those opportunities if you haven't prepared them and made it easy for them to get to it. Great. Yeah, can I chime in? Yes. <laughs> yes, yeah, no, uh, I think, yeah, that's why uh, cultivating an investor ecosystem locally yep. is really important too. So it's not just, or you have to do the project pipeline, but um, you also want people who have money and they are out there uh, committed locally. So we, we ran some numbers uh, and even like 20, 2016, 2017, uh, you know, Kentucky, Alabama, uh, uh, West Virginia, there were, you know, $4 billion of capital gains by individuals alone realized in those years. Very small fraction of this, you know, that's the flow variable. The stock of unrealized capital gains in these places is even larger. So the, the money is out there. Um, but right now, uh, Bruce Katz has a great uh, op-ed in the Financial Times today uh, that says, you know, right now all, all of our capital infrastructure is really nationalized, if not globalized. Opportunity Zones is a chance to make it local again. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah. yeah. pretty cool. Okay. We have a question here. Good afternoon. My name is Alexander from the Alexandria Economic Development Partnership. I'm curious from the discussion, the concern about investors, one of the big issues that's currently happening to many startup businesses and such um, is that they're all centralized in the major metropolitan areas, New York, San Francisco. Is there concern about bias, I mean, from investors who already are familiar with their New York and San Francisco and being indifferent for areas in, say, central Mississippi? I mean, and then similarly, since there's going to be almost now 51 different marketplaces for these opportunities zones managed by the states, is there a problem become lost in the mess where you have all these different marketplaces to try to attract investors in? So, uh, I bias wouldn't be the word I would use here. Lack of information, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. lack of knowledge would be. Yet, yeah, so I think it's getting at your your very point. Um, the question is, what does a Duluth do to market their opportunities? Right. So I think the the market is only as good as the information mm -hmm. about it. Mm -hmm. Right, and what we have is a relative lack of information about some of these other places. So uh, you're Alexandria, where there's a relative lack of information about Lunenburg County. I say that because that's where I'm from in Virginia. <laughs> yeah. um, but I'm telling you, there are lots of great projects. You all should be rushing there right now. <laughs> and so the, the question is what we do so that a uh, Lunenburg County can compete. There's no question there are more projects right now that are investable in a, an Alexandria than there are in a Lunenburg, but there are investable projects in Lunenburg as well, but the knowledge of a Lunenburg is a scintilla of what it is. Mm -hmm. That's gonna be our, question, our, our challenge or our opportunity. And there's already funds that are looking at secondary, tertiary, mm -hmm. fourth theory. Markets, mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, you know, so so I I think it's it's marketing. Put it out there. And then I would say just for us, I know our governor has been, Governor Murphy's been at the forefront of this, whether it's talking about New Jersey being the state of innovation again, reclaiming our space there through the Evergreen Fund um, or any of these other innovative spaces that we're working on, including the hub. The governor has been at the forefront as well. So I, what's competitive, that's, you, know, you just get that from that. There's so many other opportunity zones nationwide you're competing. But I think having a leader like a governor that's really actively talking about what's happening in his state, focusing on our strategic advantages, has been a real great opportunity for us. And I think that's why we've had folks like the Governance Project really interested in what we're doing. That's why we've had folks from Smart Growth highlight the different opportunity zones in Jersey City, in Newark, and in Union County, because there is so much attraction that's happening there. And shameless plug, so I apologize, <laughs> but also with having um, EIG and Forbes doing an event coming up. Um, in Newark, New Jersey. So again, New Jersey is attracting a lot of attention, and we're excited about that. Great. Did you want to add tag. anything to uh, that? Well, we can go to questions. Okay. <laughs> Thank you, sir. Good afternoon. It was a great opportunity, so I enjoyed it. But I had a, a question. One, how does smart city play a significant role in the opportunity so game? That's my first question. And number two, how do we get real estate and business in the business involved in opportunity zones? Great. Smart cities? And involvement? I, well, no, I, I, think, I, I think that a lot of it is dependent on the regulations right now, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. So, uh, uh, you know. 
how many people can get involved, how many people can benefit from opportunity zone investment. You know, can a pre-existing business that has growth plans, you know, under what scenarios might it be an investable company? All, the, all those questions are still unknown. Uh, so uh, I think that that's one of the um, biggest challenges that a lot of us are grappling with right now, just the, the fact that there are so many um, possible applications of this and we don't yet know uh, which ones are gonna uh, be pop mm -hmm. possible. And where that split between real estate and business and other kinds of mm -hmm. things will sort out is going to depend yeah. on. Yes. Mm -hmm. yes. Yep. Anyone else have anything they want to add to that? No. I just, okay. No. Great. Here in the front. Sorry to point. I'm just really grabbing the end. Or Sarah, thank you. Hi, Mike Benko, uh, co-founder of the Startup Champions Network, which is an ecosystem building organization. Um, I, I really appreciate that you all mentioned people and place, and you know, I, I know policy is has to be right there. And I think there's one opportunity where you know a lot of organizations, uh, from an economic development perspective, went after the you know the golden keys of uh, Amazon HQ2. <laughs> If you didn't get it, there's resources to mobilize there. So coalition build across the uh, the communities. And I really think for that comment on, on the real estate meeting the business, invite entrepreneurs to be at the table because they're demanding, they're fickle, but they put roots down. Right. So if you can right. breed 500 startups with 10 employees over a 10 year period, you're fifth of the way there for Amazon. So uh, thank you all for, for pointing that out. One question is, um, with the investors kind of looking at real estate now and, and not having that guidance on the operating business side, do you see there's a timing window where we might miss some really good opportunities to put good space in place for people? Uh, I think that yes, but not as, I mean, once 2019 comes and goes and people realize that the bulk of the incentives are still there, you know, they're going to uh, find mm -hmm. plenty of reason to invest in opportunity zones. Uh, so then the, the big benefit, the 10-year capital gains exemption uh, accrues to, you know, even if you invest in 2027 and then hold it for 10 years or beyond, uh, you can, you can uh, 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 enjoy, enjoy that benefit. So th that means there will be a long tail because entrepreneurs are going to come uh, uh, par, uh, pop their heads up throughout that, that window. Um, Yes, and uh, I forgot, maybe it's the, the baby. I forgot where I was going with that. <laughs> uh, I mean, just on the, on the former piece, so I used to be the Secretary of Commerce and Trade for the state of Virginia. And most folks in the economic development know that the best bang for the buck is helping your existing business. Retention. Yes. yes, retaining them and helping them expand and helping them launch. It's not going after the Amazons of the world. Uh, but we don't get the press for, for that. Uh, and we can talk about that at another time. <laughs> yeah. uh, question here. Hello, Kat Bing from Association for Enterprise Opportunity. Um, my question is, I'm wondering what your opinions are on a community benefits agreement to mitigate gentrification as well as promote economic opportunities for community members um, and also the role of it as kind of mitigating um, extractive practices, taking wealth away from the communities. Yep. Hmm. Thank you. Um, I, I'll just jump in. Look, I, I think that whether it's community benefits agreements, whether it's um, uh, again, putting together uh, funds that have a conscience, uh, um, whether it's uh, public policy, I think it's actually all of the above, mm -hmm. that it is important that um, places have these tools to deal with the risk of development. And by the way, the risk of gentrification or displacement, I should say, is not um, unique to opportunity zones, mm -hmm. right? It is a part and parcel of every development journey that we have been on. Um, and thus, it is important that uh, you at the outset, as you're thinking about taking advantage of the development opportunities of opportunity zones, you're also thinking about mitigating displacement risk as a result. And I think all of the tools that you mentioned are tools that should be on the table for that. And then just on that, the only thing I would add is just like, again, it's policy and it's people. And legislatively, cities can enact legislation that will benefit them in these spaces. So one thing that they're doing in New Jersey is focusing on inclusionary zoning ordinances, which has been incredibly helpful. So Newark and other cities are now taking this on. But it's a way, legislatively, to ensure that, again, it's not rapid gentrification, but development is happening at the pace you want it to happen at within your respective municipality. 
Yeah, I think that's really important. It's mm -hmm. not, uh, it's highly unlikely that, you know, a mandate for community benefit agreements is going to come from the yeah. federal government. That's so for the, sure. the action, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> uh, the, 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 the action there is, is going to be, is going to be local. So, yes. you know, Opportunity Zones has changed the facts on the ground for states and municipalities. Yeah. Uh, I think um, New Jersey is ahead of the curve on educating their municipalities and, and uh, in responding to that. As but, New Jersey is about everything. There you yeah, go. I like this. I like everything. this. Yeah. <laughs> Um, so, uh, and then th there are a number of organizations that, that are dedicated, including ourselves, to, to just making sure that people are aware and prepared. Uh, so the more of that you can do with your network, um, I think I think the better. Great. Another question here? We have this gentleman right there with the glasses. Yeah, hi. Uh, I'm Eagle Smilbergs. I'm co-founder of a nonprofit in Seattle that works with water entrepreneurs improving water infrastructure. I wanted to ask a question uh, about whether opportunity zones could be innovation zones. Mm -hmm. uh, the challenges that exist in opportunity zones, transit problems, food desert, healthcare access, water infrastructure, energy, affordable housing, it's a long list, are also innovation opportunities for new kinds of products, services, systems, right? Mm -hmm. So I'm wondering how to build the partnership between the opportunity zones and the innovation community of entrepreneurs, universities, federal laboratories, uh, corporate R&D centers, to see this as a market for innovation, right? And uh, there's an opportunity for some of these opportunity zones to leapfrog uh, you know, uh, into a whole new kind of world with uh, the technology that's available. So how do we build that connection, right? And how do we get the needs of these opportunity zones communicated? to the innovators in the United States? Good question. I that mean, that's question. beautiful. <laughs> yeah. we, we hire you. Yeah. <laughs> You're already thinking about it. Yeah. Look, that is the opportunity, right? That goes back to what I said earlier. Uh -huh. Opportunity zones by themselves are not going to be the, uh, the cure-all. But if we're able mm -hmm. to do exactly what you said, use it as a chance to have a dialogue with higher ed, with uh, technology, with health, with local government, with entrepreneurs. Use it as a tool to talk about the comprehensive work yeah. that needs to be done. Then you got a home run. Um, you're going to need folks who are good at selling to do this, right? I mean, this, at the end of the day, is a marketing job and it's a curating job. Mm -hmm. um, and this goes back to what I was suggesting also earlier. It means that that's going to be tougher to do in rural America because it's tougher to find that kind of capacity. It's tougher to um, yeah. But a Seattle, no excuse. It should be done. Right, so I'm holding you to it now. Well, I think we have, we have, fortunately, we have, <laughs> okay. and unfortunately, we have vast parts of our country where economic development or growth of those communities is limited by water infrastructure. It's no by question. the by without sanitation or where they're still dependent on well water. And so, part of that, and remember, for the opportunity zones, is that you're trying to convince an investor that this makes sense yeah. and that there's an opportunity for them to make money there, right? So. Part, the, one of the best ways to do that is create a track record and show the process of how this works and where it works. And you start here and you go there and you go there. And I think that there's great opportunity here, but it's also going to take not just the collaboration of all the different partners, but also having somebody who speaks the language of the investors mm -hmm. to give them a sense of uh, opportunity. Mm. Part There's of it's a, a visioning, or we, we done? Yeah. Uh, a, a visioning exercise too, which you just laid out really well. You know, the people or investors can hold their investments up through 2047 is the date in the draft regulation. That's a long time horizon, and I think communities and groups of anchor institutions and all can uh, really get together and show, you know, what commitments they're going to make, how this is going to, you know, uh, create a new urban fabric, uh, and then get people to buy into that really long term vision. and. Uh, Providence, Rhode Island, uh, you know, they, they tore down a, an old highway and now they just have kind of uh, piles of dirt that are uh, they're looking forward to reconnecting, you know, their downtown space with some neighborhoods. Uh, that's exactly the sort of uh, area that's an opportunity zone. They designated for this sort of reason. That's just, you know, crying out for this collective visioning. Uh, so, yeah, I, I hope more people listen to you. I want to add one other thing. This is also where you have an entrepreneurial mayor or a mm -hmm. city manager or county man. Ooh. This is what they should be doing. 
right? Sweetening the pot to get those other sectors to play yeah. uh, just like you suggested. I mean, that's, that is what the real, I think, opportunity is here. I saw a question here, a question here. Why don't, I why, don't, why don't we take your two questions? We'll have the mic in one spot, and we can take both of those. Thanks. Uh, yes, my name is Jeff Epperson. Um, my background is commercial real estate investments. My de development is my background, uh, but I'm also a vice chair of the Anacostia Business Improvement District. Mm -hmm. Spent the last 20 years a lot in Anacostia. And I think it's often lost in these discussions, and I've been to at least a dozen of them, uh, all from the real estate perspective where they were driven. Uh, in that at the end of the day, these opportunity zones were all chosen because they were distressed. Mm -hmm. They didn't have good jobs, they didn't have good economics, and that's why they haven't been invested in. There are those occasional outliers where there's not enough information about that community to draw capital. But for the most part, investors have looked at these communities and said they cannot afford new development. There's not jobs that will justify that. There's not enough money to buy retail. And this is happening in Anacostia. We can't get market rate development. We can't justify it over there. Retailers go over there and they look at the incomes, say we can't make a living here. So there's a, there's a lot of talk about uh, working, the, the community working together, and these are all necessary ingredients. But at the end of the day, these areas all have one thing in common. They don't have enough good jobs. And when you have enough good jobs, developers will flock there because that's how profits are created. And all the Opportunity Zone is doing is enhancing the return, but it's not fixing something that's pretty broken. And these are all in that category of pretty broken. Mm -hmm. And so I don't see generally in all these meetings enough discussion about how do we get jobs here? How do we get good jobs here? Mm -hmm. And that's got to start at the state level Agreed. because these local groups don't have an economic development group to compete with Alexander, Arlington, Fairfax County. Somebody's got to go in there and, uh -huh. and deliver those 20 okay. and 40 and, uh -huh. and grow the entrepreneurs locally. That's a start. But you've got to get some real good jobs in here that can justify new construction. Because otherwise, it's just getting excited about not much, quite frankly. OK, so I hear the question <laughs> is, um, do you need to start with jobs? And if so, yeah. so but let, let me just take her question, yeah. too. Sorry. And, and if so, what do you do about that? <laughs> yeah. I, we'll come to that, but I did promise you'd Give get your question. Give me a chance question. to get back at that. I will. Don't worry. Uh, it sounds like that's inspired a lot of thought, so I'll keep it brief. My question is about sustaining a national conversation mm -hmm. around equity, inclusion, and pace-based development. And so sort of a two-pronged question. One is media press coverage around this. like. If you wished there was a nuance or some aspect of this that would enter that coverage, what would it be? And okay. the other is you've described a rich kind of emergence of coalitions and partnerships and people coming together committed to place. And is there a role for philanthropy or others to sustain that beyond the initial investment? OK. So I heard, what would you <laughs> want to hear from media? What's the role of philanthropy in supporting some of the energy and yeah. coalitions? and? The oh, jobs question. I, right? <laughs> so first off, I'd love to see a lot more being mm -hmm. written about how the communities are going to be impacted or mm -hmm. what communities can do to mitigate impact um, in the, um, from the community perspective. So most of what we read about is coming from the lawyers or from the accountants or from the, <laughs> the, the REITs, right? And it's all one very specific perspective. Um, and so that, that would be my, my first wish. And, um, so I mean, a couple things. One, philanthropy can jump on board whenever they're ready. I mean, so even as we're doing, no, and I'm, I'm very serious about yeah. this, right? Because I think that states are moving forward. You have New Jersey EDA doing these innovation challenges. And the call really is for philanthropy to step up and put their money towards these initiatives that are helping to build up capacity. Because once you do that for a municipality, that's going to be longstanding. You're, you're teaching them how to fish. You're not just giving them food for one day. You're teaching them how to fish. And that's something that is incredibly sustainable for the long run. So philanthropy plays an incredibly important role. They do do capacity building a lot. But I think this is a different space for them. But it's completely time for them to jump on board in this um, 100%. And then I would just say this for states. I know we're working on our NJ Ford program, which is a job creation tax credit, right? So we're focusing on high growth, um, high job growth and high wages as well. And so there's an incentive that is attached to that. So states are focusing on that. Again, these are proposed. And so we're hoping that gets to the legislature. But states are hyper-focused on those areas of growth. Great. All right, Maurice, you held back, <laughs> but go. <laughs> so how much time I got? <laughs> Look, there is no argument that mm -hmm. we need to attract more jobs to Anacostia. 
right, or any place mm -hmm. like it. The potential to attract jobs to Anacostia, though, is great. Look, we already see in downtown Anacostia on, on Martin Luther King, I probably am giving away something here. <laughs> We've got a big um, um, cyber company coming that's going to locate right there, that's going to bring 250 plus jobs. You've got the city's Department of Housing and Community Development that's right there on the other corner. You've got a whole curb of uh, groups of small entrepreneurs that are beginning this journey, and you're just across the bridge yeah. from bringing other businesses. So yes, you're right that we need to get jobs there. Um, can we get the jobs there? Are there assets to get the jobs there? Absolutely, but you've got to be very intentional, just like we've discriminated against Anacostia to create some of what's there, we've got to now be just as proactive and aggressive in trying to attract the jobs. I mean, so I don't Anacostia, disagree that. Anacostia has the ability to leverage y'all just three miles up the road to the District of Columbia. Yes, so they absolutely. So have a unique ability to bring those powers to bear. Absolutely. The other 8,000 people need someplace else. Uh, well, I don't know. Would you pick one? I'm, I'm in Peoria, Illinois, right? Where in Peoria and is... Out of the metro area. Yeah. Like I said, there are opportunities in all of these places. Now, are there as great as an Anacostia? No. Um, but all of these areas have assets within them that they can, you can build on. Uh, mm -hmm. There's no question that there, there's a spectrum, mm -hmm. right? And so to your point, but the notion that we've been around for 40 years. In Opportunity Zones alone, we've invested $2.5 billion dollars. We have gotten every penny of that back. We haven't lost a dime. The notion that you can't find investable projects is belied by our history. Mm -hmm. What we need are more folks investing with us. We need to do more preparation work. If you're in rural America, you need to get broadband down. No question about it. Mm -hmm. That's the game changer for, for most of rural America. With the commitment, we can do it. We sent people to the moon. We can put broadband <laughs> in Galax, Virginia, <laughs> right? It definitely does. Mm -hmm. It definitely requires the state, mm -hmm. public and private. But um, the notion that it cannot be done, that we should turn our backs, that we should say, nope, there's nothing there. Wasn't, wasn't making that well, I want to be clear. Wealth, you're not going to get Without wealth. investment, you You've okay, got I to. Got a queue of you've questions got to be. <laughs> you've got to want to do it. You've got to have the will in the public and the private sector. But I can show you plenty of communities where it's happened, and Anacostia, by the way, is one that where it is happening. Great. Give me ten years, and let's go back over there. I'm I'm looking at Dan. Do we have Twitter questions, or should I stick with the room? Okay, great. I have some people back here who've been patient. Sir, do you have a question? Thank you. Um, HUD just um, released a notice asking for ideas about how the federal government can help. So I just wondered if you could talk a little bit about ideas that you have for how federal agencies can support Opportunity Zones. Kenan, have you seen that? And do you have some ideas? Uh, <laughs> I know it's out. I have not read it yet. Oh, that's right. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> the baby um, but, factor. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Others on the panel? Have you taken yeah, a look at that? Or what do you think the, about uh, HUD? Final regulation so that you can use it for operating businesses as their primary. They are. But also, there's programs like Rapid Response and the Alpha Version that are funded out of the federal government that allow workforce development boards and allow the local on the ground people to work with the operating businesses, helping them grow and helping them access resources. That would be the other thing that I would say is incentivize or include policy that dovetails those existing resources because there's a lot of federal money that goes out and, and the rapid response money goes to every county in this country. Every county in this country has access to that money. And so it can be used in conjunction with something like that. Yeah. And to think that uh, SBA and Minority Business Development Agency and uh, all these groups should should uh, be prepared uh, if hope the regulations are out soon and good for operating businesses to really coach businesses on how to become yeah. eligible. Uh, so that's not with respect to housing, but I think that uh, that would be uh, really fantastic for wealth building and for business creation and generation. Throughout and the there, there are lots of dollars coming out of these federal uh, entities sweeten the pot for opportunities. Agreed. Agreed. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Agreed. And, and the way you have in New Jersey. Jersey. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Question in the back here. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Jason Green. I'm the co-founder of a company called SkillSmart, which is a, it helps turn economic development projects into workforce development stimulants. 
So I really appreciate the conversation around that. Uh, I think going back to the conversation around uh, community benefit agreements, I think what was kind of at the heart of that is so much of the conversation is around outcomes. We talked about jobs outcomes, you know, community benefit outcomes, but I haven't heard a lot about what's the rubric of evaluation for whether or not you know a project is successful. And I think and we heard about return on investment, but I think I think just return on investment for many that think about this would be an insufficient measure of success. Okay. So. Thoughts on what that appropriate evaluation metric should be? You know, when we had our prep call, um, that was one of the questions they asked me. How would you consider, a <laughs> what would be a success successful investment to you? And my response is, well, what's your perspective? What, who's looking at it? Mm -hmm. Because the investor is going to have one answer. The people who are affected by the investment will have another answer. The new people who are getting the new jobs will have a different answer. Um, and I think at the end of the day, if, if you're looking at the people who have the public's welfare at my, in, in mind and are responsible for it, whether it be municipality, local nonprofits, local workforce development groups. Um, I think success has to be one that allows the um, one entrance to um, good paying jobs mm -hmm. that helps them grow wealth in the community where those jobs are being created. And, so, and I think that's, it's not an impossible thing to do, but it takes a little more, ch it's a little more challenging, it takes a little more work. Mm -hmm. And I would say just decrease unemployment rates. And we started earlier just talking about the wealth disparity, um, which was the top of the conversation. So I think being able to understand what those gaps are and how those gaps have been have been shrunk by the work around opportunity zones. So I think being very clear and intentional about what that means for communities. Mm -hmm. And from the researcher perspective, I just I really need census tract level data yep. um, that's detailed on you know what uh, what types of investment, how much, how many investors went into what neighborhoods, because you know, this is going to work for some communities and not others. And we need to know, you know, this, this is a policy experiment, let's be honest, right? And it's, it's, the, it's a challenge that calls for experimentation, so that's good, but we have to know what worked and what didn't work. Um, so that's, uh, I mean, that, that is uh, also uh, as fundamental as the operating business thing to the viability of this whole enterprise, um, because I mean, the, the Applications are really vast here, uh, so we, you know, it's going to be hard to preordain uh, or uh, say at the outset what this is going to accomplish. Um, mm -hmm. So we need to know, you know, what what surprises came along the pike too. Yeah, and I would add, I think you're going to want transaction mm -hmm. metrics and census tract metrics, mm -hmm. right? That you're going to need two levels of metrics here to truly yep. measure what's happening mm -hmm. and whether we're accomplishing what we want. Okay. I feel like I'm going to take three quick questions. We're going to do a lightning round of questions, so please keep them crisp, <laughs> and then lightning round of answers, because I've got about five minutes left. Sir, you've had you, you still have a question back there? You've had your hand up for a while. Uh, I think my question is uh, aimed at Keenan. I'm up to and from the Midwest, Youngstown. And the narratives that I've heard today are not unlike the narratives that I've heard over the last 25 to 30 years. Okay, it's a great form of optimism of what these programs can do, but it really doesn't get to many of the issues facing communities. I mean, just I was thinking that recently, the mm -hmm. water department money was being used for economic development, and the state is now sanctioned. So when any time the city or the state uh, tries to add to the pot, they often have to take from the existing things that are going on. My question is really simple given that sort of background. Is what you're talking about a form of adaptive resilience, or is it a form of cruel optimism? Mm. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Okay, we have a, I know we have a question back here. Hi, uh, my name is Nikki Edmonds. I'm a law student from American University, and my colleagues and I are part of our school's community and economic law development clinic. Um, and so I have a two-part question for the panel. Um, I've heard from the panel that it starts with the locals and uh, the community. So how do you propose more community involvement from residents that view opportunity zones as a threat to their localities and as a threat to their displacement? Um, additionally, what of potential displacement or replacement of local establishments that are already in place, such as community land trusts that already involve uh, community members and are currently working towards the same goals that opportunity zones claim to be, um, but want to maintain any and all growth within the community and within the residents and uh, provide them opportunities for upward mobility? 
Okay, great. So I hear, so my question, one question is adaptive resilience or cruel optimism. <laughs> and the second question is how do you take people who've been working on these issues with strategies that they think are working and get them to focus on opportunity zones if they think they're actually going to be extractive or displacement generating rather than an opportunity? Good questions. Yeah. Who wants to jump in first? Well, on, on the people question, I think that's important. I'm, I mean, for a number of reasons, that's why municipalities have to drive a lot of these efforts. They should have point people within their respective municipalities that are driving the work and the conversations around opportunity zones. They have to have point people there that can be accountable for this, right? So at the end of the day, when you are a public servant, you are there to serve the public. So I think your question is excellent. So those existing organizations, those existing entities have to be part of this process, not cannibalized by this process. And that starts with the municipality's leadership engaging, encouraging them, but also for them to want to be part of the process as well. So it's a two-way street, right? So they have to want to be engaged, and the municipality has to start taking movements right now to ensure that they're going to be included, because they should be. I agree with that 100%. Mm -hmm. I would just add to that, opportunity zones are in law now. Mm -hmm. they're, gonna, they're there. Yeah. It's happening. Mm -hmm. um, the best way to ensure that it's not just extractive uh, or something mm -hmm. that the community finds undesirable, it's for the community to get engaged, right. right? And so uh, my, my, what I tell folks on this is, look, we can't afford for you to be a critic from the sideline. We gotta get engaged in this because the law has passed. Mm -hmm. This is happening, it's already underway. So it's up to us in the community to make sure that that we're playing. I would, I would just add, the people you're talking to about incorporating opportunity zones into your existing strategies are investors. And so you need to be able to talk to them in the language that they're going to understand and understand how investing in a community land trust is going to give them the return that they want on their investment. And if it doesn't, what are you going to do so that it does make it interesting to them? And so it's not, I don't think that they're mutually exclusive. Mm -hmm. But you have to understand how the, they can fit together. And I'll speak to uh, Youngstown. Uh, so it's it's at least it's it's informed and good intentioned optimism. Uh, and and I well think played. yeah, uh, I think that uh, opportunity zones is really a product of the zeitgeist. Uh, and um, you know we see the rise of the rest uh, happening uh, both in financial commitments and in like real startups, including in places like Youngstown and your incubators and all. Uh, we see that um, people have a renewed commitment to place, and we see this across the developed world. It's roiling our politics, et cetera. Um, so I think, I think there is a real moment here. Uh, and then uh, we are aware of a number of really great uh, investment funds that are committed to investing in startups in the heartland that are just waiting to announce once the regs are uh, favorable, if the regs are favorable and dropped, uh, that I think will um, will we'll hopefully uh, reinforce that, that, that optimism. And then, uh, you know, some, I think some communities like yours are at, at a turning point. Uh, I don't know about Youngstown, but Akron celebrated that they stopped shedding people last year and like added 12 yeah. uh, for the first time <laughs> excuse me, in a long time. Um, and, and that may, yeah, that, that, uh, that, that uh, there's a sense that, you know, the, the, one, one wave of, of economic change and disruption has ended and we're entering a second one that hopefully will not be quite as concentrated as, as the prior one. So can I just add, okay. just, I'll try and be quick. <laughs> okay. uh, we are at the precipice of an, un, of an unprecedented transfer of wealth yeah. in our country. One that we've not seen before and we won't see again for two generations. So if it was the same people trying to solve the same problem for the last 35 years, I'd say, yeah, it's probably cruel, what was it, cruel? Cruel, cruel optimism. Cruel optimism. <laughs> yeah. But I think the factors are different right now. We have a number of different things that can make it different, and we have levers that are available to us, like the Opportunity Zone, like this transfer of wealth, mm -hmm. like this desire and, and a growing economy, to try and take advantage of those things to make it different this time. I think it's resilient optimism. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just going to point out that we could clearly talk for much longer, but we are at time. Uh, I want to thank our fabulous panel for this conversation and thank all of you for your uh, energetic engagement in the discussion. But big thanks to this panel. Thank you. Thank you.